cool. Thank you, Janet. Um, so welcome to the series, uh, Speaking Up for Point Malate, in which uh, invited speakers will address key questions and issues about Point Malate, and uh, members of the public can ask questions. Um, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement. Um, we honor the Ohlone people for whom this area is home and who were the traditional stewards of this land. The descendants of the Ohlone live among us now as documented by recent DNA studies and they merit our respect for their culture and for their ancestors. Um, so um, let me, uh, Janet, could you show the, um, the second slide, please? Thank you, Janet. Um, I'd like to announce um, that um, on Saturday, April 23rd, there will be a celebration of Earth Day at the Point Malate Beach Park, starting at 11 a.m. and going till 3 p.m. And so everyone is absolutely um, invited to attend. Um, okay, so now let's go to... Um, um, I'll, I'll just give an overview. Um, can we go back to the first slide, please, Janet? Thank you, Janet. This is just the slide from the website about this particular program. Um, so the overview for today's session is that Jeff will speak for 30 to 40 minutes and then will be available for questions. Um, please limit your questions to one minute, but if you would like to raise more complex issues, please put them in the chat so that we can consider them for future sessions. Um, and though issues around Point Malati can be contentious, let's be polite and courteous. Also, please use the chat to let us know how we can improve, or you're welcome to leave your email there if you would like us to send you announcements directly. Um, all chat will appear in the recording. Um, I'll put the web page for the speaker series into the chat, though all of you probably have found it already. Um, and this session and future sessions will be recorded and posted to the web page. Um, so introductions, um, I'm Sally Tobin, the co-founder of this speaker series. Um, Pam Stello, uh, Pam, if you would just give a quick wave. Pam Stello is uh, my partner in crime and co-chair of the Point Malate Alliance. Um, as Zoom administrator, we have Janet Johnson, who is co-coordinator of the Sunflower Alliance, co-chair of the Richmond Shoreline Alliance, and the victorious lead organizer of No Coal in Richmond. Um, so now I'll introduce our speaker, uh, Jeff Kilbreth. Um, Jeff is a retired software business executive with a background in, man in management consulting. He has a significant work experience with financial modeling and accounting. He earned an MBA from Yale University in, with a concentration in operations research and accounting. He also served two years on the Richmond Planning Commission. And the title of his talk is Point Malate, Could This Project Negatively Impact Our General Fund? So here's Jeff.
is um, screen, am I, have you got me authorized to share my screen? Janet's nodding. That's no, not. Well, I gotta say, hang on. Well, maybe we let's see. Are you seeing something? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I want to stay focused on the slide, so I'm going to um, minimize everything and go into slideshow mode. Uh, so hopefully you'll have to, you'll have to say something. I won't be looking at, um, uh, at people's faces. Uh, all right. So uh, the, the subject is, could the Point Milati development project uh, that's been championed by our mayor for the last uh, few years uh, negatively impact our general fund. Um, I think the important point here is that it, uh, the answer to this question is yes, it could. Um, it was unfortunate that it took uh, until the last minute before it was documented clearly enough with people with open minds enough to, um, you know, to make the right decisions, and I think we're now on a on a path that reflects the decision that, in fact, this project would negatively impact our general fund. Uh, okay, so what's in this presentation? First of all, some background uh, about the project that's important to the financials of it all, and also some difficult to measure risks. Uh, secondly, what SunCal promised uh, two years ago when they uh, were uh, looking to get the city council to approve the, the, the planning commission and the city council to approve the project and what they asserted and what they promised at that time, uh, then what are the elements of risk to our general fund? In other words, what, what things could happen? What are the levers in the model, so to speak, in the in the in a uh, what you might call a financial pro forma has many assumptions in it, and um, there and every assumption, of course, by definition, is an assumption. So it might not be an accurate assumption, and you have to know for each assumption what is the range of possibilities, and then decide what is safe, what is prudent, what is likely what is possible, you know, all of those things. And then we'll talk about what safe assumptions seem to be. Uh, and, and if you take those safe assumptions, what are the fiscal impacts to the general fund? And then finally, what did the city, you know, what did the city council vote do a couple of weeks ago? You know, what did they actually decide and why did they do it? And a few thoughts on the lawsuits that um, the mayor never misses a chance to talk about. Okay, so the first point is, this is an extraordinarily, extremely unusual development project. I mean, I think that you could be on a city planning commission for 20 years and never see anything remotely as unusual or as risky as this project. Um, the first point, of course, is that, as most people know, the property insurance and bank mortgage banking industry require a dedicated 24 by 7 fire station. Why? Because it's a remote location, there's only one way in and out, and only one lane each way. Secondly, there's, it's a high fire risk area, an extreme wildfire zone and adjacent to many Chevron fuel storage tanks. I mean, it's not a surprise that they require a dedicated 24 by seven fire station. What is a surprise is that our mayor 
and other people who were championing the project didn't appreciate immediately that maybe that fact changed everything. The annual costs to our general fund uh, would be over $6 million a year in two or three years to have a dedicated fire station out there. It, is, it never happens in any normal development project that the city actually has to add $6 million to its annual operating expenses for the project to, to, to proceed. I mean, it's just very unusual. And then finally, it's not so much that the 300 to $450 million in infrastructure is sort of so impossible to imagine or that you wouldn't see it in some project, other projects. What is unusual is that there would be that much infrastructure work to, to do for a, 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 a location that can only fit around 1,500 housing units. That's the problem, you know, on the infrastructure. You know, it's not like the number necessarily is impossible, but the number is an awful lot of infrastructure spending for only 1,500 housing units. Okay, so as you can, if you did the math, you could see this works out to a basically two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per housing unit, which is just way more than a community finance district is ever asked to support. Um, normally, it's more in the neighborhood of you know thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars per ho per housing unit. In contrast, a park with a modest development plan could spend far, far less on infrastructure, maybe as much as 90% or more less. And that's a really big deal, right? All right, a few additional background points that are critical. Um, and one is, is a, sort of a continuation of the last point. The buildable land is limited. It's a very challenging site to develop and the buildable land is limited. They originally thought that maybe they could, you know, fit 4,000 homes, and then it came down to 2,000 homes. And in the final proposal two years ago, it was 1,452 homes, with over 80% being condos and townhomes. So you can see, you know, they wouldn't have done that if they didn't have to. In other words, they would have much preferred to have 2,000 units or 4,000 units but they couldn't actually come up with a design that would, um, that would uh, fit that many units. Um, secondly, the current Richmond shoreline market for new condos and townhomes runs, you know, basically 450 to $525 per square foot. And that's true for both new construction and for resale, although of course, Maybe there are some resale units that go for as little as 500, I mean, as little as 400 a square foot. And there are probably a few uh, really nice uh, units that go for as much as $550. But you get the idea. This is the range and it's very relevant because this is, I mean, you know, people, they're talking, unless you really want to believe that Point Melati is going to be a next by Tiburon, and become Tiburon East. You know, Point Melati is in Richmond. And looking at a project like the Waterline project uh, next to Seacliff in Point Richmond is far and away the most comparable thing that we could look at. And that project was beautiful, came out wonderfully well. Um, and it sold for between $450 and $500 a square foot. And they sold about 25 a year. Uh, units. So that's a very important market comparable, or as they say in the industry, a market comp uh, to, to focus on. And there is no particular reason to think that uh, condominiums at Point Melati would sell for, you know, any more than, you know, 525, really, you know, I mean, there's just no reason. Um, it's obvious, the last point is that it's obvious 
that if you start in year one with a cost of 6.5 million for staffing and operating a 24 by seven police and fire station, and it takes 15 years to sell all of the units, it sure seems like we could have a lot of general fund losses during the build out period. Well, they, we only got the developers to admit that a month ago. Um, and that tells you something about the whole nature of the approval process and the whole discussion. These build out period losses were only acknowledged at the last minute and SunCal called it a concession. And it was an offer to cover them, but without any guarantees. So you sort of say, well, oh, you mean you're, you, you say you'll, you'll say you'll cover them, but how do we know you, you will cover them? And the answer was a deafening silence. We'll get to that again later. Um, and finally, there are a few risks that are hard to quantify and are sort of like not in the numbers because you, you know, you just, you can't, you can't do it really. They're speculative, but they are, they are known possibilities. And that's part of what risk analysis is all about. So the first one is site preparation costs. You know, as, every, as many people know, the site was a fuel depot for the US Navy for many, many, many years for all of World War II and the Korean War, and I believe also into the Vietnam War. Um, this is part of what is uh, driving the delayed groundbreaking of the Terminal One project that was approved in 2015, but which uh, still hasn't broken ground. It turns out that, you know, once you get into it, uh, there are surprises in these old industrial sites that have either toxic problems or maybe they're on, there's part of it that's on fill and, and nobody really kind of understood what that was going to mean until somebody started actually wondering what would it look like to put a building here. Uh, second thing is construction cost inflation. It's a big deal and every, everybody knows it. You know, you've heard for the last year or two about, you know, the horrendous increase in lumber costs because everybody talks about lumber. But uh, what's interesting is that concrete and steel have gone up much more than lumber, and they're much less likely to come back down as inflation subsides. There's a lot of reasons for this. I don't want to go into it now. But, um, you know, the, the point is, there's some uncertainty around construction cost inflation and how bad it will get and how long it will last and uh, and in particular what will happen with any development that is based on building five or six story or higher uh, uh, buildings with a lot of steel and concrete. Um, you know, in some of these situations, you can imagine that the developer could just realize that costs had gotten out of control and just stop construction in the middle, you know, imagine Point Malati with a 24 by seven fire station with 500 units built and construction stops. You know, that wouldn't be a pretty picture. Um, and then finally cost of ownership problems, um, which are really marketing problems and selling problems. Mortgages, mortgage rates, as people probably know, are already over 5%. And literally they may be over 6% in two or three months. Certainly in three years when this project could be built, there is a real possibility that mortgage rates could be seven or 8%. I mean, I personally bought my first house in 1978 and the interest rate was like 10 or 11 or something. You know, it makes a huge difference to what people can afford to buy and what, what, you know, what, what prices they can pay um, and uh, what down payments they, you know, are, are, are required, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think everybody appreciates those issues. Okay, so um, on the construction, uh, you know, right now we have some real Richmond uh, data points on the magnitude of these risks on construction costs and demand. Two major shoreline projects, uh, Terminal 1 next to Miller Knox Park and the quarry at the corner of Canal and Seacliff Drive, 
are both projects that were originally designed and were approved. Uh, Terminal One was approved when I was on the Planning Commission. Um, they are projects that that are were originally basically condo projects, um, and now in both cases the developers are asking. Uh, for Richmond to approve them switching to single family homes to avoid the, the, the two things, the two problems. I mean, why are they doing this? Why are they asking to change these, these already approved projects? Because the cost of five to six story condo construction is now substantially greater per square foot than two story single family homes and townhomes. Um, and secondly, because the high end market, which is what the shoreline is, right? Um, the high end market really wants single family homes more than it wants condos, which isn't to say that condos aren't sellable. It's just to say that it's a problem if the prices get too high, because if you're gonna spend that much money, a lot of people would just rather have a single family house. Um, and in Point Milati, unlike these other two projects, at Point Milati, this isn't an option because if you didn't build the condos, uh, the, the big buildings, um, you would have room for only about 200 single family homes. So in no way does this begin to, to help you uh, cover the shortfall in paying for the uh, dedicated police and fire station. Okay, so SunCal's claims for the projects, for the project in their project proposal, which is what was approved by the city council on a four to three vote in 2020, was, hey, it's a great benefit to our general fund. There will be over 10 million per year in surpluses for our general fund uh, once all the houses are sold. Secondly, no subsidies required from the city. Third, manageable infrastructure costs. Paying for it would only require 100 or 150 million in CFD bonds. The exact amount was always a little vague. In fact, it was remarkably vague. But in any event, the clear impression was this was no problem and, and, and the CFD, the Community Financing District, would only need to uh, be authorized for 100 or 150 million in bonds. Okay, remember those points. <laughs> um, now, what are the general fund risks? In other words, in a big project like this, that is unusual because it has a 6 million or six and a half million or 7 million later, you know, as, as inflation goes, a six or seven million dollar police and fire station cost, how is it going to cover those costs? Well, these are the things that are essentially drivers of whether those costs could ever be covered. The first is absorption rate. How fast do the units sell? Does it take seven years, 15 years, 20 years, or 30 years? to sell 1,452 units out at Point Milwaukee. Um, the second is selling prices and what the average appreciation and housing values will be over you know, an extended period of time, 30, 50 years, two, three, four, five percent What's the annual turnover rate on homes for transfer tax purposes? This is actually very important because Richmond gets a significant tax for every whenever a home sells. And that's very important and real significant money. But there's a big difference between whether 8% of the homes sell every year or 15% of the homes sell every year, right? Um, the inflation in police and fire costs is another critical issue. Um, historically, our fire and police costs have risen at a higher rate than any other element in the city budget, any other element in the general fund budget. Um, same question as with housing appreciation. Do they go up two, three, four, or five percent? It's the exact same question. Um, and you could 
say, well, maybe they're going to go up about the same. Um, household taxable purchases made in Richmond for sales tax purposes. Um, you know, Richmond, as everybody on this call knows, I, I think, um, Richmond doesn't have great shopping opportunities. And many, many people spend a lot of their taxable purchases, make a lot of their tax, taxable purchases in El Cerrito uh, or in um, even in Albany or Berkeley, but in particular in El Cerrito. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a, that's, that means that you can easily over, overstate how much sales tax revenue you're going to get if you don't know Richmond and don't know people's purchasing behaviors. Um, another critical point is commercial development at Point Melati. Uh, it turns out that the prod project uh, financials were based on a belief that uh, $150 million in assessed value would be created by building mostly office space. Right now, office space doesn't look like a good thing to be building. And it's always been kind of questionable whether anybody wants to have office space out at Point Melati. I mean, there are a lot of places in Richmond right now that have very inexpensive office space where you know, it's not all leased. It, you know, Richmond is not that attractive to the office market. And um, uh, it's really unclear whether a lot of office space out at Point Melati would be successful. And certainly here, we're not talking about whether it might be successful. We're talking about whether we're sure it's gonna be successful. Because if it's not successful and uh, it either doesn't get built or, or it doesn't get leased, then you know, it's not gonna pay those property taxes that are implicit in saying that there's $150 million worth of space out there. And finally, if the community finance district can't cover the, the bond um, payments over 35 years, then we have a different kind of general fund risk there because the city's responsible for dealing with that. The city wouldn't actually have to pay the bonds off but the city would have to spend a lot of time and effort. The, our consultant estimated that it would be around a, a million dollars um, for essentially coping with a default. Okay, so SunCal's assumptions in 2020, um, there were seven of them that are really important. Two of them, they changed a month ago at the last minute under pressure. The, fir the first of those two was that the approved project would, would be selling condominiums for almost $1.3 million in a five-story building. Now they admit that that was 30, that the real market prices now and what they always were is 35 to 50% lower than that. That's a huge reduction in projected selling price. You can imagine how much, what that does to our property taxes. Secondly, that the impression was that all units would sell in seven years, you know, pretty quick. Now, everybody agrees, well, it probably, it, it, it certainly could take 15 years and, 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 you know, who knows, maybe even longer. Um, 15 years is still a lot. That's 97 units a year. Um, personally, I think the answer is somewhere between 15 and 20. But you know, you'll only know when you build it, and then you see what happens. So right now, our problem is how do we assess the risk, and what assumptions should be made to to fairly characterize the risk and model the general fund uh, in revenues you know, cash flows in and expenses out. Okay, and then there were five things that were either incorrect um, or wildly optimistic. And they still haven't said anything about it. But as I say at the bottom of the slide, the city attorney and the city's 
uh, community finance district consultant understand these serious flaws very well and completely agree with that this list is significant. <coughs> the first is they decided to that the way they would do the financial model was to essentially ignore um, time. And what I mean by that <coughs> is that it's a lot easier to say, well, you know, costs go up and revenues go up. So it's all just a wash. So don't worry about how long it takes for the units to sell. Just use today's cost dollars and today's selling price estimates and model how the, all the costs and all the revenues work when all the units are sold. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if you start out with your costs being at six or six and a half million, and your revenues take you know 15 years to get to six or six and a half million, you know, you're gonna have a lot of losses in the initial period. Um, but more generally, what's true is that with Prop 13 limiting sales ta uh, property tax revenues, I mean, obviously houses can still continue to rise in, in, in selling price, but anybody who's living there, their property taxes can only go up 2% a year. So it's a drag on the city's growth of revenue and it impacts a, a number of revenue streams. But the long and the short of it is that um, it is in fact important to do what anybody in business would call a 50 year cash flow analysis on the project. And they never did it. They were asked many, many times to do it and they never did it. And the reason they never did it is what you're gonna see in a moment is that it proves that this project has no chance of, be, of, of not negatively impacting the general fund. Um, they also said that they thought that people would spend $18,000 a year on taxable purchases in Richmond. And they said that the unit turnover would be 15.5% per year for transfer taxes. And they completely miscalculated utility taxes and they counted on 150 million in assessed value for commercial property of which 80% was, was to be office space. Um, I think you can see what, where this is going. So if you use safer assumptions, assumptions that can be you know, grounded in, his, in history and reality, you know, the following seems to be safe. You could say that at, there's, at some price, you could sell everything in 15 years. And that's probably true. But to be safe, you could also look at what would happen, what if it took 20 years and they could only sell 73 units a year instead of 97. Um, the initial assessed value of the units on which property taxes are based, this seems, I mean, this is, in some respects, this could be generous, but right now, I'm assuming 1.5 million for the single family homes, 800,000 for the condos and townhomes, and 435,000 for rental units, because it turns out that rental units uh, basically get, uh, get assessed at lower rates. Um, and 3% for inflation in home prices or appreciation of home values, 3% for inflation of fire and police costs, 10% turnover rate on the, on the units that are sold and owned as opposed to the rentals, um, household taxable purchases in Richmond of $7,000 a year instead of 18, Utility taxes based on the revenue that residents currently pay on residential utility bills, and no, and not, and and not to count any revenue from commercial development. Now, of course, you could argue with any one of these points, and if you had a spreadsheet like I do, you would just change the spreadsheet and you would see exactly where where we stood. But using these uh, assumptions, 
this, this, this is what it works out to be, that the general fund would have $52 million in expenses greater than its receipts, and that that would have to be covered by SunCal's proposed special fiscal impact tax on undeveloped land, which was their last minute proposal. This, this is a best case scenario, right? So this means we trust SunCal to pay that 52 million every over the course, each and every year over 13 years up to 52 million. And it assumes that we can use the pension tax revenue um, for general fund expenses. It's not clear that this is a safe assumption. Um, I, I mean, I didn't want to get into an argument with the city attorney about it. He wasn't sure, but he thought it might be okay. But everyone should just know that, and we'll get to this later in summary, but if the pension tax revenue can't be used, there's another 100 million in losses over 50 years. Uh, so bear that in mind, we'll return to that. But the real important point is that Richmond would lose 141 million from year 14 to year 50 if police and fire costs and home prices go up 3% a year. In other words, if they're both if they're both 3%. We never reach break even, never. The closest would be a $380,000 loss in year 15. Annual losses would start growing in year 16 as police and fire costs continued to rise at a 3% rate while our Prop 13 limited property tax revenues are going up you know, more like two and a quarter. 50 years out, our annual general fund shortfalls would likely be between six and eight million a year. But that was just the, that was the best case, right? What else could go wrong? Or put another way, what are, the, what are the worst cases that might happen? The project isn't a big hit, takes 20 years to sell so many units, prices only go up 2% per year, the total general fund shortfalls um, are actually 250 million, and SunCal has to pay 75 million of that over 17 years. And, and we have to pay 175 million uh, after the 17 year period. The second problem could be that the pension fund tax actually can't be used uh, to pay for the police and fire expense because the police and fire expense is a general fund expense. The pension fund goes in to pay the pension liabilities. Now, the, the idea would be for people who say that we should count it, you know, the idea might be that we're paying other monies into that pension fund and we would just use this money so that we didn't have to pay other money so we'd be come out ahead. But you know, as you can tell, that's all very squirrely and no way to run a business, shall I say. And um, it's also un, you know, kind of not verified. So, so it's, a, it's a hope, it's a, it's a guess and a hope by people who haven't really looked at it carefully and, and haven't gotten second or third opinions on the question. I think Richmond could get sued, you know, potentially for, for, uh, for this kind of thing. I don't know. Um, and then finally, SunCal, the guarantees that SunCal was offering to cover the losses in the first, you know, in the first, you know, thir 13 or 17 years, depending, um, would be paid by their shell company, Winehaven LLC. And that shell company could declare bankruptcy at any time in the middle of construction with only 500 or 1,000 units built. And the city likely loses, in that scenario, 400 or 500 million uh, because, you know, we wouldn't get all 14 
1,452 units built in that scenario, um, or at least not for without significant delays. So that would um, result in uh, a lot of losses, a lot of shortfalls because of having fewer houses paying property taxes. Um, and, and then they would also stop paying uh, the losses in the in the during the part of the development period. So for both of those reasons, the losses that could be as much as 240 to 300 million would jump up to 400 to 500 million in all probability. And SunCal has a, is a company that has a significant history of, 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 of shell companies going bankrupt uh, under these kinds of circumstances. Okay, so faced with all of this information, uh, what did our city council do, and what did they vote? You know, what, why did what did they why did they why did they vote to not approve the uh, community finance district? So the answer to that is that um, the city's uh, community finance district consultant, who who works for the city was paid by SunCal to you know, help facilitate making the community finance district happen, confirmed that 1,452 homes could never pay 292 million in CFD bond principal over 35 years. Never, not even close, while keeping total homeowner tax payments to 2%. And this is very important for those of you who are homeowners in Richmond, you'll know that your property tax bill is basically around 1.6%. Um, that means, you know, that's, you know, the county tax plus all the additional assessments um, that get tacked on, including the Richmond pension tax, which is very big. Um, but uh, what this what what is general industry practice it may even be state law i think it may be state law as well you can't um you can't create a cfd that will charge people more than two percent of assessed value for their tax on 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 total taxes so if you're at 1.6 in richmond you know you you've got 0.4 left for a cfd and that's not a lot of money. It's not, you know, think of it as being, I got a $200,000 mortgage and you think I'm going to be able to, you know, pay it off, uh, you know, with $250 a month. And, you know, the answer to that is no, $250 a month is not enough to pay off a $200,000 mortgage. Um, and that's the way to think about, about this. But that's what they asked for. And we could only say yes or no on that, right? It wasn't like they didn't they didn't say please approve a CFD and we'll tell you later because they can't do that. They said we want a CFD and we want authorization to be able to to um, to get up to 292 million in bonds. So that was actually all that was needed to say no, because this was unexpected, not supported and not realistic. In fact, it was impossible. Um, and you ask, why would we be doing business with somebody who would actually ask our city council to do the impossible? And why would we do business with somebody who wouldn't even bring a, an amortization schedule with them to show how they thought that those bonds could actually be paid off in 35 years? They didn't do any of those things. Um, at the end of the day, what the previous numbers that we've been walking through tell, told the, the majority of the city council clearly was that you would have to believe that home appreciation would exceed police and fire cost increases by two or three points. Like homes would go up five or 6% a year for every year for 50 years versus 3% for police and fire costs. But there's no basis for thinking that that's realistic. The condos and townhomes in Marina Bay and Point Richmond have only averaged 3% over the last 20 years. 
3%. You know, maybe in Palo Alto or San Francisco or Berkeley or the hills of Berkeley, house, houses actually have gone up 5% a year, you know, for 20, for 20 years, but not in Richmond uh, and, and not most places. <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> uh, and, and not in all of San Francisco even. <laughs> okay, you get my point. Um, the special fiscal impact tax on undeveloped land that was proposed by SunCal at the last minute, you know, it might cover the sh initial build out period shortfalls of between 50 and 70 million, but the losses after build out were, were just simply ignored unaddressed and, and not, you know, not discussed in any meaningful way. Um, and secondly, as I said before, they were not uh, the, there was no guarantee offered um, to back it up. In other words, there was no, you know, proposed escrow fund. There was no, uh, you know, liens on, on SunCal assets. You know, there was nothing that would give anybody any any protection at all, any guarantee at all that SunCal would stand behind this guarantee. So faced with these three, three things, um, every, every we're, we're running a little bit long on time. I think there's so, only one more um, slide. We'd like to leave room for questions. Great, thank you. Um, so these three reasons were why they voted to refuse to go forward. And I think that they were wise in doing that. And then the last couple of points on the, on the lawsuits. Um, the, can see, the casino developers are on record as being happy with getting 22.5 million. We have no real reason to think that, you know, they aren't, wouldn't continue to be happy with that. The environmental lawsuits go away immediately if a park is being created. And finally, SunCal has a very weak hand to play in, in any lawsuits they might file or any negotiations they might enter into. Their financial models and claims were inaccurate and highly misleading. Their proposed solutions to protect the city have been completely inadequate. Their lack of earnest money and need for $292 million in bond funding is simply not acceptable. It's not viable. And finally, the development agreement protected the city by asserting that there can be no negative impact on our general fund. So our city council simply exercised their rights under the development agreements clause um, to, um, to uh, say that we've got a problem here. So instead of the hundreds of millions in litigation and settlement costs that the mayor has claimed, um, everything could be wrapped up with 25 or $30 million. And um, that is perfectly possible to raise that kind of money for something that won't lose the city money and that will um, uh, create something that is viable. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. That was fabulous. Um, uh, and we'd love to have um, questions from the community members who were able to be here tonight. Um, and so please use the raise hand uh, feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, for some of you that may be under reactions um, and Pam uh, will call on the speakers and uh, she'll also check the chat in case there are additional questions. Um. Yeah, Joe Puglio has a question. Joe? You're on mute, Joe. Joe, you're on mute. I'm unmuted now. Has, has uh, SunCal proposed uh, providing a security bond issued by an insurance company to indemnify the city? 
Has some Cal considered that? I, you you would have to ask the city attorney. I, to my not to my knowledge, Sun Cal offered nothing, and the CFD consultant who works for the city and was working for the city attorney uh, said that their offer was no guarantee. I, I that's all I needed to hear. If you want to probe what else, you know, you need to either talk to the CFD consultant, you know, or or to um, uh, the city attorney. No good. Their word is no good. Their word, well, their word is no good, and uh, and <clears throat> they aren't offering to have an independent fiduciary guarantee their word. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions? David? And then Sally? Oh, I, I had a few. Um, the, let's see. Um, why doesn't SunCal pay losses until the total build out? 1452 units and uh, reaching break even for the city. Why isn't, why couldn't that be a requirement? Would that work? Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought I addressed that clearly. It's hard to keep the numbers straight. Um, SunCal's position was, don't worry about the, you know, uh, the timing of things. Um, when, when everything's sold, everything's cool. Um, that was their position until a month ago. A month ago, they admitted that they couldn't guarantee that, that there would be losses in the in the build out period, and they said, "But we'll cover the losses." Right. So why don't they pay all the way through the total build out? Uh, and why don't they give us fifty two million right now? Whatever. No. Whatever the losses are along the way. They have to pay them until the total build out. That was what they proposed. They break, yeah. That's what they proposed. They proposed that they would pay the law, cover the losses up until they had sold all of the development parcels, you know, basically. So I'm just, in my mind, I'm saying that means two or three years from the point where all the units are sold. And so if they paid those those losses for 13 years in the 15 year scenario, then that would cost them 52 million. And that's what they offered to pay. That would be, you know, think of it as 4 million a year for 13 years. The problem is that there, it was just their word and the word of a shell company that whose whole purpose in life is to be able to declare bankruptcy with no assets. So we can't take that as anything, it, it is not protection for us. Well, of course it would have to be guaranteed. But that was to Joe's point, there is no guarantee. Oh, well then that, of course, then that's not acceptable. Uh, Correct. Yeah. That's it. Thank well, you. Sally? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, whether you can uh, talk for just a little bit about why the health of the Richmond General Fund is important to people who live in Richmond. What's going to happen if the General Fund starts um, having to uh, compensate for these big losses? Uh, oh, I mean, I mean, I think this is. I think everybody understands intuitively if they follow the city's annual agony over 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 coming up with a with a with the following year's budget it's really hard and it's really hard from multiple directions it's hard to have enough reserves you know any any business any any city government any state government needs reserves whether you call it a rainy day fund or you call it something else people you can't operate a significant entity that people depend on 
without reserves. Richmond skates at the edge of having enough reserves. So we we can't uh, you know we can't we can't do that. We can't we can't we have to increase our reserves. We can't take gambles to uh, subsidizing upper middle class housing that would you know further hurt our ability to ever get really to a position of adequate reserves. But the same thing could be said about many social services. You know whether and from potholes to library hours to youth sports to summer jobs. You know there's lots of things we want to do more of and do better, and all of those things are put at risk by definition if you are signing up for um, uh, subsidizing um, an upper middle class housing development at the at the far end of um, town. Thank you. Jeff, there's a question in chat uh, from David, uh, Captain, regarding um, who would pay for the settlement. Uh, um, uh, so, if if um, if the deal with Sun Cow falls apart, uh, which seems you know pretty likely, um, uh, then then essentially either some other developer you know, has got to be found who's, who, who's smarter or better or luckier than SunCal and, is, and can figure out a way to make it work. Um, I don't believe that's going to happen. And I, if I've done anything, I hope I've shown you the magnitude of, of the losses, the magnitude of the risks here. That's not going to change with another developer by much. So I think that all of this makes people understand that the best option, regardless of what you think about the environmental issues, the value of open space, and many other you know, perfectly worthy considerations, that the only thing that makes sense for the city of Richmond financially is to make it a park. And so the question of where does the money come from it comes from people who value pu public land, public space, open space, parkland, youth recreation, and stuff like that. All of which, you know, we could we could do something pretty terrific out there, um, you know, for a modest amount of money. But we've got to find enough foundations and uh, and and um, you know people who value those things to to be able to raise the 25 or 30 million it would take to, to buy the land and settle all the lawsuits. And then you gotta raise another 25 or 50 million to turn it into a, a terrific park. Um, but all of those numbers are much, more, are much more manageable and much more realistic than um, uh, having a, uh, uh, you know, um, a 24 by seven uh, police and fire station for um, upper middle class condos. Thank you, Jeff. That's, that's a, a great way to close. And I really, really appreciate the great job that you've done tonight, laying out all the financial risks uh, involved in the current uh, proposed development. Um, does anyone have any other closing remarks? We promised we'd close right at seven. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, and I, I would just like to say one, one last thing about um, our city council. Um, you know, the four members of our city council, um, uh, Eduardo, Gail, Claudia, and Melvin, you know, they were given really bad information uh, by the the cities by the SunCal paid consultants, and you know they figured out that that you know what was really going on, and they had the courage to stand up, you know when 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 we were when it was showtime. So I think everybody should uh, say thank you to them for staying the course for not giving up and for seeing through the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the web of 
misrepresentations and misleading assertions and bullying and nastiness and whatnot. Um, they did a great job and um, it's not easy. There's, you know, you, everybody knows how many issues come before them and there's a lot to read and the numbers are hard to, to go through a project like this with this kind of financial analysis. It's, it's not easy. So I think everybody should be grateful to them for having stayed the course and getting to the right answer. Thank you, Jeff. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll go ahead and close now. And um, the recording of this session will be posted on the website. Uh, and uh, we'll let you know what's going to happen next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and Sally, thank you.